the day after it happened, I felt no guilt, no remorse. I was just numb. I started walking. No destination, just walking through a mass of people living their lives. No one cared about my blood-stained clothes. Probably thought it was my blood. And if it was, good riddance to me. One less asshole begging for scraps and driving down the value of the neighborhood. Down. I ended up in the subway. Sitting. Think about how easy it would be to just step off that platform and into the path of the next train. It would amount to a temporary inconvenience. An hour or so, maybe. The money slows down, but it don't never stop. Hustle and bustle step right over you and keep going. Sooner or later, the sweepers will toss your remains on top of the heap. Top of the heap. Bottom of the barrel. And that's life. That's the reality. My daddy had a say. Said to me, boy, if you live to be a hundred, no matter where you go, you won't never see a billboard. Say, looking for a fool. He was right. There's just too many fools to go around. I found my way to an alley. Not unlike the one where I... You know what I did. Anyway. I'm sitting there. And this black limousine pulls up. Window rolls down and the man in the back says, Yo, I on in, man. Let go for a little ride. Now, I ain't never rode no limousine. I can't possibly have anything that this man wants. So I said, to hell with it. I take him up on the offer. I go for a ride with him. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, sit down, man. Have a seat, now. Nah. Get comfortable, you know. Relax a little bit. And your driver, circle around the block. Now, what's your name? It's a strange thing being homeless. Not talking to anybody for years at a time. That moment when somebody finally asks you what your name is. That feeling you get when, just for a second, you got to think about it. There ain't nothing so horrible as forgetting your own name, even if only for a second. I tell the man my name. <laughs> I don't know what kind of name that he is like. You gonna need a nickname or something, man. Uh, let's see. Yeah, man eater. Yeah, man eater. How about that? And that's another thing about being homeless. People will take you for a joke. <laughs> Look, man. I'm just messing with you, man. All right, calm down, okay? Calm down, cause you... Look, bro, you gotta admit, you know what you did with some pretty nasty stuff, man. Like, come on now. Come on now. But you know what? On some real talk, that's just the way the world like work, ain't it? Everything is food for something. Like, everything is food for something else. And, you know, you eat the wolf. You know, you, you eat the wolf or you the sheep. Hey, man, this this is man proceeds to give me the wisdom of the world through his eyes. I understood what he was saying. Can catch, can catch what you gotta eat. I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. It's a dog eat dog world out here. 
And half these folks out here got on bacon flavored drugs. Now, you know, it's been a, a, a very bad uh, world for most of us. You know, you got your psychos and crazy mugs and things like that. You know, guy running around killing folks. You know, you got your little stuff like that. You got governments like ours, you know, not caring about his own folks. Same folks voting me in, they don't give a care about them. You know, starting wars, and you know, for what? Profit, power. But it all come back around to the most basic, simple principalities. It's consume or be consumed. Hey, yo, driver, pull over over here, man. Now, look, all jokes aside, all playing aside, let me tell you something. When you get up out this car, you're going to be as poor and as disposable and as unimportant to this world as you was when you came up in this world. But if you paid attention, if you're paying attention, you might be just a little bit smarter. Because yeah, <laughs> you sure need it, man. You dropped me off on the rich side of town. Yeah, thanks for the ride. Dropped me like a punchline from a joke. Yeah, good luck. I looked around and everywhere I looked up were people who had everything I ever wanted. They had cars. They had homes. They had food. Warm. Hey, my man. Food. Make it a quarter. To them, I was Nickel. worse nah, than a man. ghost. Whatever you got. I was a monster. I ain't no goddamn Not because anything I done. Man. You understand? Oh, man, I'm a human I being. Was. Made a plan how I long look. turns. Made a few mistakes in my life. Who hasn't? You know what I mean? Just give me a break. Because how I talk. Give me a goddamn break. Because how I breathe. Same thing every day. Same broken ass cycle. You know, that's the funny thing about being homeless. Cost of living. The living You're wage. Invisible. Wage slave. Until you Gotta be way out. Can't do it. Gotta be somewhere. Financial slavery. Go. Get yourself locked up. Proper education. Have a roof. What a nice and job. I could have been. I could have been somebody. Does it ever been? I mean, this is my punishment. Does it ever end? This is what I deserve. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee. Make thy vile. The shark You are trash. You are bum. You are nothing. And no because of what I've done to Carl. On some real talk, that's just the way the world like work, ain't it? Hey man, it's either eat or be eaten. Eight or be eight. I wandered the bountiful earth for what must have been days, maybe weeks. Stomach rumbling. Head pounding, howling at the moon. I'm still a man! I'm still a man! I'm still a man! Until that rich man in his black limousine pulled up alongside me again. Well, 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 if it ain't the main eater. <laughs> like I said, I knew what to do now. What you say? What you know, boy? I had purpose. What you say? What you know, boy? What I say, what say is thank you for opening my eyes what to the ugliness say? of reality. I say, what? people are animals. The world is a jungle. And in order to survive, one must adapt. What you say? I say, what you the powerful and those that want to be are always looking for an angle, looking to play on your weakness. I say, they measure by what they can take. It's all about surviving and how they can use you as a step stool. Eat the rich. 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 What you say? 
What you know for what? Now I know the ABCs are my enemy. Affluence, barbarism, capitalism. Don't make eye contact with those you step over. Let them rot in their own filth and take heart that it could never be you. What you know for what? If they won't move when you walk your walk, you call the cops to outline them in chalk or sift through the huddled masses. Seize the diamonds in the rough and sell it back to them like that shit was yours. Into the growing trend of cannibalism and another man's face. It's functioning perfectly. It exists. The problem of inequality. The question that emerges here is not when are we going to eat the rich. It's how are we going to eat the rich. Because I'm thinking I'm going to char grill them. I'm going to have motherfuckers heads and spikes. I'm going to roast them like marshmallows. You get me? For more stories like this. He thrust his spade into the hollowed ground. The tip of it bit down into the soil like Adam's teeth did the storied apple. Hungry and starving for her. Again and again, building up a rhythm, his tool thrust steadily, repeatedly. Hit the like button and subscribe. It started with falling. Have you ever had one of those dreams where you're endlessly falling and wake up just before you hit whatever's at the end? This time, though, I didn't wake up. I hit the ground. When I say ground, I mean a surface. It could have been a wall, the ceiling, anything. It is... A dream, after all. At any rate, my body, through no will of my own, received the signal to get up, which action I performed slightly wobbly, though I have no idea why. Thus, I made my unsteady way in a seemingly random direction into a black that seemed deeper than black, somehow giving off a feeling of, I don't exactly know how to explain it. Nevertheless, I continued, feeling as if I was in a cutscene in some horror game. I had some sort of tunnel vision the lighter grayness around me slightly blurred as I descended further into this abyss. I pressed on for another few minutes, a phantom pressure boring into my head from all sides, filling my ears with distorted sound like I was underwater. The void around me seemed to draw closer and closer with every step until I could almost feel the darkness constricting me, squeezing my body and drawing out all rational thought, replacing it with a primal fear. I attempted to scream, but no sound came out. You are the one in control. You never have been. It told me. You are a mere puppet, played by the hand of fate. For that is what we are. Fate. Destiny. Providence. Divine order. You are conducting to the role of the darkness of reality and its primal whiteness. And with that, I could feel hands choking me, pulling me further in, tearing at my flesh with hunger and ferocity. That primal fear returned, this time more visceral more real, as I felt myself fading, fading from everything. 
I had ever known. For more stories like this, I was awakened by something shaking my shoulder. A hand. I startled. What the fuck? There was a large hairy creature sitting next to me on my bed. And subscribe. I wake up. I go to work. I play the game. I get home. I go to sleep. I wake up. I eat a breakfast. I go to work. I play the game. I get home. I wake up. I go to bed. I go to work. I play I the game. Up. Get home. Go to work. I go to sleep. Play the game. I wake up. I get home. I eat a breakfast. I go to work. I, wake up. I play the game. I eat a breakfast. I get home. Go to work. I go to bed. I play the game. I wake up. I eat something. I play. I wake up. I go to the bar. I eat. I go to sleep. Play. I wake up. I eat. I, go to I watch. I, I go to sleep. I, I watch. I, I go watch. to sleep. I go to sleep. I watch. I wake up. I go to sleep. I go to work. I, I play the game. I, I, I wake home. up. I go to sleep. I go to work. I wake up. I play the game. I eat a breakfast. I get home. I go to work. I play the game. Work. I wake up. I eat something. I play. I go to the bar. I go to sleep. I wake up. I watch you go to sleep. I eat something. I play. I go to the bar. I watch. I go to sleep. I watch. I go to sleep. I sleep. I eat a bird. I watch. I go to work. I go to sleep. I play the game. I wake up. I play the game. I go to bed. I wake up. I eat something. I play. I go to bed. I go to sleep. I wake up. I eat. I watch. I go to sleep. 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 I sleep. Go to work. Play the game. Play the game. I wake up, I go to work, I play the game, I get home, I eat a breakfast, I eat a breakfast, I play the game, I go to bed, I wake up, I eat something, I play, I go to the bar, I go to sleep, I wake up, I go to stories like this. Oh, Reverend Paul died today. I ain't much like him, so I won't miss him much. He taught me my letters, but he smacked my knuckles hard with his switch when I messed up. Once he even made them bleed. Nah, I won't miss him much at all.
hit the like button and subscribe. The Meat Pit was a popular restaurant in the heart of the city, known for its exotic and unusual dishes. It was owned by a wealthy and enigmatic man named Victor, who had a reputation for being a bit of a recluse. Despite its popularity, there were always whispers of something sinister lurking within the meat pit. Some claimed that Victor was eating human meat in his dishes. A rumor that he always denied. But as the years went on, the rumors only grew louder. One night, a group of friends decided to pay the meat pit a visit. They were curious about the stories that they had heard, and they wanted to see if there was any truth to them. As they sat at their table, studying the menu, they couldn't help but notice the strange looks that the staff kept giving them. The server seemed nervous and agitated, as if they had something to hide. As they waited for their food, the friends couldn't shape the feeling that they were being watched. They glanced around the restaurant, trying to spot the source of their unease. But all they saw were the other diners, busy enjoying their meals. When their food finally arrived, the friends were a little disappointed. The dishes were overcooked and bland, nothing like they had expected. They tried to make the best of it, but they couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As they finished their meal and prepared to leave, they noticed something strange in the kitchen. The door was slightly ajar, and they could see movement inside. They couldn't resist the urge to investigate. As they peeked inside, they saw something that they would never forget. The kitchen was filled with human body parts hanging from hooks and stacked in piles. Victor was standing in the corner, a wicked grin on his face as he watched them. The friends fled the meat pit in terror, their minds reeling with shock and disgust. They knew they had to do something to stop Victor and his twisted restaurant. They went to the authorities, telling them everything they had seen. An investigation was launched, and it wasn't long before the truth was revealed. Victor had been using human meat in his dishes for years, luring unsuspecting diners to his restaurant with the promise of exotic flavors. The meat pit was shut down and Victor was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. But even now, there are those who claim that the meat pit still exists, hidden in the shadows, waiting for its next victims. For more stories like this. What? I asked, glancing back at him. It had to be somebody crossing the street then. I'm not too sure of that. Whatever crossed the street definitely had some antlers or at least horns. At this point, I considered the possibility that he was messing with me. However, seeing his nervous expression in the rearview mirror made me reconsider this. Hit the like button and subscribe. She fixed her makeup and applied a coat of hot pink lipstick on her lips as she stared at her reflection in the grimy mirror. Satisfied, she combed her silky raven black hair that she had always been proud of. She opened the wardrobe 
and glanced through her modest collection of gowns and dresses before choosing a dark red silk maxi dress. The hem of her dress floated around her ankles as she walked briskly to the door, slipped into her favorite pair of high heels, and opened the door. Her phone emitted a soft, melodious chime that she detested. She reluctantly took her phone from her purse and glanced at the notification bubble on her lock screen. Her body froze momentarily before she put away her phone and resumed walking. Her phone emitted another chime after she entered the stairwell. She ignored it. Her ringtone sounded. It was her favorite song, yet she did not feel the same happiness that she usually felt when hearing it. She hesitated and answered the call. Hey, where are you? Her boyfriend asked in a worried tone. I saw your Facebook post just now. Are you okay? I'm coming over to your house in three minutes. Her shoulders heaved. She bit her lips and ended the call. The flight of stairs ended at a heavy metal door. She ignored the white no trespassing sign and pushed the door open. A frigid gust of wind smacked her across the face. She stepped onto the deserted concrete platform and paused to admire the stunning night view. The melodious chime sounded again. She took out her phone again and inhaled deeply. Someone commented on your Facebook post. Don't be such an attention whore posting this kind of stuff just to attract views and likes. Someone commented on your Facebook post. Actions speak louder than words. Why don't you jump? Then maybe people will start taking you seriously. She screamed. Her phone smashed against the cold concrete with a sickening crunch of glass and metal. Her heart pounded in her chest painfully each beat seemingly a stab to her bleeding heart. She gazed at the tiny shards of glass scattered on the ground and sobbed quietly as she walked away. Her phone rang, even though the shattered screen remained unlit. Her favorite song played. Its melodic melody wafting to her ears. The door swung open violently and collided with the cracked concrete wall with a loud, hollow bang. He ran out of the stairwell and onto the cold, barren roof. There was a pair of high heels that was placed precariously at the edge of the roof. Fearing the worst, he approached the edge carefully. His foot stepped on something sharp. It gave way instantly and shattered into a million tiny broken shards. For more stories like this, my earliest memories are of the water bowl, its silvery metallic surface and wide flange. Spike was a heavy drinker too. I used to watch him drink with amazement. Amazement at how much water he could move into his mouth with that big tongue of his. Of course, he was a lot bigger than me. Being a pit bull and all. Hit the like button and subscribe. Intermittent Explosive Personality Disorder. It is that ever-present voice inside that speaks of unbridled rage. It begins as a whisper, matures to a scream, radiates burning rage. Its indignant nature is integral to the transformation of woman to wolf. Our subject tonight is one now 38 Nicole H. Smith, mild-mannered wife of Mr. Thomas A. Smith, aged 
41, mother of three children. Joshua T. Smith, aged nine years and six months. Teresa H. Smith, just seven years old. On the morning of October 10th, 1992, Miss Nicole H. Smith, then aged 34 years, was tasked with getting her two young children ready for school that morning. When suddenly, Miss Nicole H. Smith suffered some unconfirmed and factually unsupported mental break where she proceeded to kill her children. She proceeded to murder them, rendering them all but unrecognizable in the aftermath. And then, following a brief call to 911, Miss Nicole H. Smith proceeded to disrobe and run through her normally quiet suburb, reportedly howling like a wild beast for being apprehended by local authorities and placed into protective custody at Polyandrum Psychiatric Hospital. Mr. Thomas A. Smith would later testify that Miss Nicole H. Smith had on several occasions confessed to him a werewolf fantasy. She had on alleged occasions referred to the two of them as lichen lovers. Yesterday, I was in the park with my son. He recently turned three. We were playing at the swing, and on the other side of the park was a lady sitting alone. Initially, she was reading a book. But after a while, she dropped the book and was just looking at us. It made me uncomfortable, but we continued playing. Right in the middle of swinging, my son jumped off and ran to her and said, Hey, Mom, to her. I was running after him. I was calling out his name, and he ignored me while addressing her as Mom. She ignored him for a bit, and she grabbed him and started calling him son. I was boiling at this point and grabbed him from her. She then started screaming and yelling at me, saying that Jaden was actually her son. I don't know what came over me, but I punched her in the face 
and she dropped. I'm still shaken up by this entire thing. We've moved around the country a lot, and now I remember that we used to live in this neighborhood before I found Jay. We're leaving now. He's hiding in me shopping cart as we usually do. He's been crying since he saw that lady. He thinks she's his mom. What do I do now? He's so scary, isn't he? Uh. <laughs> Let's visit Granny's house. Let's go to Granny's house. She's always full of cheer. You better save your tears. Let's visit Granny's house. Let's go to Granny's house. <laughs> Marshmallow Monster Munchies. But first, a word for my sponsor. Bud and Lava Lava Tell one to tell another It's all about Bud and Lava Bud and Lava Lava Spread the news all over From the herb fields to the shower Aha! Tinker Boondocks representing Bud and Lather Herbs and Soap See? I make handcrafted cold process soaps And a number of other skincare products And we're working on a bunch more But right now on the website we've got uh, Four kinds of soaps And they're each terpene inspired Like basabalol and the, the mint blend And the eucalyptol um, And we got some other ones That are curing like caryophylline uh, And they're all Inspired by the terpenes That you find in cannabis And they're hemp infused Soaps so, But we do a lot more To make marshmallow monster munchies You'll want to grab cake frosting and either a nonstick baking tray or wax paper coated with a thin layer of butter to line the cookie sheet. Four tablespoons of butter, which you'll melt in a saucepan. Five cups of marshmallow along with one teaspoon of vanilla extract, which you'll then toss in and melt. Six cups of crispy rice cereal and one additional cup of marshmallow that you'll pour in and stir. Take the marshmallow mass and spread it evenly into the nonstick baking tray. Let it cool, cut it into squares, and apply the frosting however you want. See? Even scary making some too. If you enjoy visiting Granny's house, click the like button, subscribe, share this video, and let me know what you thought down in the comments. And I'll see you next week at Granny's house. For more stories like this. The last move up. I am still here. 
to the last of Vashka Tashka. I am still here in this prison. <laughs> Hit the like button and subscribe. Here he comes, here he comes. Boogeyman living in a scary house, selling the scaries with a stitched up mouth. <laughs> To the scary show, the home of grunge storytelling. Imagine a world where society doesn't advance for 50 years. All the same problems that we had, the racism, the violence, the manipulation, the control still exist 50 years later. And no one's thought to rise up against it. It had to be flashing like the Daily Double, like the Daily Double. It had to be playing on TV. It had to be loud mouth on the comedy hour. It had to be announced over loudspeaker, over loudspeaker. The CIA and the Mafia are in cahoots. It had to be said in old ladies language. It had to be said in American headlines. Kennedy stretched and smiled and got double crossed by low life goons and agents. Goons and agents. Rich bankers with criminal connections. Dope pushes. Dope pushes. And CIA working with dope pushes. Dope pushes from Cuba. Working with a Big time syndicate from Tampa, Florida. And it had to be said with a big mouth. Said with a big mouth. It had to be moaned over factory foghorns. It had to be chattered on car radio news broadcasts. It had to be screamed in the kitchen. It had to be yelled in the face where uncles were fighting. It had to be howled on the streets by newsboys to bus conductors. It had to be fogged horned into New York Harbor. They had to echo, echo under hard hats. It had to turn up the volume in the university ballrooms. It had to be written in library books. Footnote. Footnote. It had to be in the headlines of the Times in Le Mans. It had to be barked on TV. It had to be heard in alleys through ballroom doors. It had to be played on wire services. It had to be bells ringing. Bells Comedians ringing. stopped dead in the it middle of a joke in, in Las Vegas. It had to be FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover and Frank Costello Syndicate Mouthpiece meeting in Central Park, New York, Weekends, reported Time Magazine. It had to be the Mafia and CIA together, together starting War on Cuba, Bayo Pigs and Poison Assassination headline. It had to be dope cops, dope cops in the mafia who sold all the heroin in America. It had to be the FBI, FBI. and organized crime working together, working together in cahoots against the commies. It had to be ringing on multinational cash registers, a worldwide laundry for organized criminal money. It had to be the CIA and the mafia and the FBI together. together. They was bigger than Nixon, bigger than Nixon. And bigger, than bigger than war. It had to be a large room full of murder. Full of murder. 
had to be a mounted ass, a solid mass of brain. A red hot head. A scream in the back of the throat. It had to be a kid that can't breathe. Had to be in Kissinger's brain. It had to be in Rockefeller's mouth. It had to be central intelligence, the family, all of this, the agency, mafia. It had to be, it, it had to be organized crime. One big set of gangs working together in cahoots. Hitmen, murderers, murderers everywhere. everywhere. The secret, the drunk, the brutal, the dirty, rich. On top of a slag heap of prisons, industrial cancer, plutonium smog, garbage cities, grandma's bed sores from father's resentment. It had to be the rulers. They wanted law and order. And they got rich on one protection for the status quo. They wanted junk. They, junk. they wanted at They wanted at They wanted Kinsuke. They wanted Warren in Indochina. Indochina. Had to be the CIA and the mafia and the FBI. Multinational capitalists. Strong arm squads. Private detective agencies for the rich. For the rich. And their armies, and their navies, and their air force bombing planes it had to be capitalism. The vortex of this rage, this competition, man to man to man. The horse's head in the capitalist bed, the Cuban turf. It rumbles in hitmen and gang wars across oceans. Bombing Cambodia settled the score when Soviet pilots manned Egyptian fighter planes. Chile's red democracy bumped off with White House pots and pans. A warning to Mediterranean governments. The secret police have been embraced for decades. decades. The NKPD and CIA keep each other secrets. The OGBU and DIA never hit their own. The KGB and the FBI are one mind. Brute force. And full of money. Full of money. Brute force. Worldwide and full Full of money, full of money, through force, worldwide, and full of money, full of money, through force, worldwide, and full of money, full of money, through force, worldwide, and full of money, full of money. It had to be rich, and it had to be powerful. They had to murder in Indonesia, Indonesia 500,000. 500, they had to murder in Indochina, murder in Indo 200, million. 200 million. They had to murder in Czechoslovakia. They had to murder in, they they had to murder in Chile. Murder in Chile. They had to murder in, Russia. murder in Russia, and they had to murder in America. For more stories like this. I know when someone is going to die. I call it a gift, if you will. It is incredibly useful to me. My ability first manifested in middle school. Hit the like button and subscribe.
late as usual. Please don't let me down. I deserve this one birthday wish. Another year older, huh, Didi? <laughs> I can't stay long. I just wanted to say hey and go easy on sauce, honey. You remember what happened last year. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Happy birthday. Thanks for coming, Tex. Are you having a good time? I didn't know what to get you, so I brought you a gift card for Caffino. Yeah. Anyway, there's like 10 bucks left on it. Uh, seriously? Hey, Rick. Oh, uh, boy, happy birthday. Great party. Thanks. Excuse me. Oh, no, not on the... Perfect. Jeez. Who does that? Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Hey, Miss Bang. I got you something. Thanks. You didn't have to do that. Open it, open it, open it. Give it here. I'll open it. An autographed picture of you. Yes. Now you can see me every day after I become famous. Come on, Patsy. <laughs> You're going to be late for your photo shoot. All right, you guys, let's cut no, some cake. Really, you shouldn't have. <laughs> what took you so long? <laughs> Diddy's parents told her to close her eyes, blow out the candles, and make a wish. She did so, assuming that her wish would come true. But her wish never materialized. Year after year, Diddy made the same wish ever since she was five <laughs> years old. She didn't wish for a pony. She didn't wish for a new toy. Didi's wish was not like the wishes made by other children her age. Didi wished to meet the boogie man. And so, Every birthday, <laughs> Didi's wish would be the same. <laughs> now in her 30s, Didi's wish has finally right, come thanks. true. That was starting to feel crazy. <laughs> 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 Well, well, I was beginning to think you forgot all about me. But seriously, if I have to come out here and do this again, I might as well off myself right here on stage. Having filled their bellies with laughter, the clown stumbles off stage, where he is devoured by crimson-colored curtains with teeth of white tassel, and spat out backstage. Bravo, they say, hoping him to his feet. Great show, they say, lying as always. The clown hears nothing, deaf from applause, oblivious to jeers. It started as a job. It became a joke. Over and over again, he would deliver the same punchline, but neither he nor it ever seems to get old. A 
clown has no feelings. Its place is on stage. Its purpose is to feed them more and to do it again. It's what they wanted for me, and they would say anything to get it. Excuse me, pardon me, the clown says, politely pushing his way through the other performers and stagehands, en route to his dressing room. Flashbulbs blinding, seasonal bouquets sneezing, grease paint running, ducking, searching for sanctuary. The introvert's blight is the extrovert's delight. To be alone can be a joy most fulfilling, as peaceful as slumber, as quiet as the dead. Away from the cacophony, away from the whirlwind, just beyond reach, the knob. Trigger, just out of sight. The clearing, approaching, calm like fire, raging, silent, entangled, stifled, impeded, halted. There is a story, long handed down by many generations of clouds. It goes on to say that there was once a cloud who became so very anguished and hopeless that he went on to consult a doctor. The doctor looked him over and finding nothing physically wrong with the clown, suggested that he go and see the spectacular Commedia dell'art. Go to see the clown and laugh yourself well. The clown was suddenly able to break through the encroaching crowd escaping their grasp and dodging their pretensions. But they would give chase in pursuit of him on his quest for the door. Surely salvation lie beyond its cedarwood facade. Surely solitude and simplicity would soon be waiting with open arms to receive him and make him whole and to cleanse him and to console. There, the extroverts blood is the introvert's delight. To be alone, a joy most fulfilling, as peaceful as slumber, as quiet as death, away from the cacophony, away from the whirlwind, just beyond reach, the knob, the trigger, just out of sight, the clearing, approaching, calm like fire, raging, silent, Entangled, stifled, impeded, halted. The clown then reflected back upon his visit to the physician. Back to the moment he looked at him and sadly replied, I am the clown. Finally reaching the door, he flung it open. He had hoped to find sweet isolation waiting inside, or perhaps there was still one bullet left as a bitter consolation prize. Instead, on the opposite side of the dressing room door, the clown was met with flashbulbs blinding, seasonal bouquets sneezing, (coughs) and the hungry roar of the crowd, starving for another encore. But seriously, if I have to come out here and do this again, I might as well off myself right here on stage.